what I am interested in in terms of using both language and poetry and concepts is to kind of create a sort of habit or a way of thinking, a way of moving, a directionality in thinking and in experience. And for me, that directionality is definitely outwards, you know, not out of the intimate self, out of the conventional human world, out of language, out of the known, you know, to go to, to push to the outside. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. It's sort of a romantic gesture. In some ways, it's a extraterrestrial or science fiction gesture. But it's also a kind of post human gesture. And that's where it hooks up with other things that, you know, you and I have talked about and other things that we're, we're both interested in is that there's a kind of way of like, of refusing to sort of remain within the purely human and to try to lean out or, or open up a, a doorway or a portal to something that lies beyond that uh, orientation. Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to episode 132 of the podcast that explores our place in time. And this week's episode is hugely overdue. It's a conversation I recorded with one of my great inspirations, cultural critic, scholar, philosopher, weirdo, Eric Davis, about his fantastic new MIT Press slash Strange Attractor Press book, High Weirdness, examining the lives and work of Terrence McKenna, Robert Anton Wilson, and Philip K. Dick from a religious studies perspective, because this book is based on the, the PhD thesis that Eric wrote while studying under Jeff Kripal at Rice University a couple years ago. And I really believe is just a a truly extraordinary investigation of that which cannot be explained through any kind of social constructivist approach about the totally bizarre horizons of human experience. Now, we had Eric on the show uh, recently, actually, episode 99 to talk about some of the ideas behind this work, but it was before I'd actually read the book, before it was actually published. So after a deep and thorough read of High Weirdness, I came to this call with like dozens of pages of notes uh, and a lot of stuff did not get into this conversation, but I really, I just cannot recommend this book enough. And uh, I think if anyone is not already familiar with Eric's writing, in particular, his book Techno uh, about which I interviewed him at length. You can find that on my YouTube channel, uh, as well as his podcast, Expanding Mind, which I'll include the two episodes I was on his show in the show notes. That was my introduction to the podcast world, actually, back in 2011 and 12. You're in for a real treat. I think uh, Eric is is just a, a true, rare, excellent very important mind in expanding the uh, membrane of what we are willing to even consider to discuss in an academic context, a, a true guide and navigator to the world of the weird. So I'm delighted to, after numerous uh, hilarious snafus involving the editing of this episode, I'm, I'm glad that I can finally share this with you. But first, I, I want to give a shout out to all 153 people supporting Future Fossils on Patreon. Those of you helping me keep this show independent, ad-free, and uh, beholden to no one but you, the listeners. The new Patreon supporters this week include William Mazdra, Kelly Ferner, and uh, Bobby Levy, who edited his pledge up this week. Uh, All of you, I I deeply appreciate everybody who has been commenting on posts, uh, leaving uh, insightful remarks on the Patreon stuff. And uh, this week, we've got a a special extra bonus thing, which is the last 12 or so minutes of this conversation, which Eric and I agree didn't quite fit in with the rest of the stuff, but I think is, is really awesome. He indulged my questions about the black goo and uh, a possible archetype of, of human transformation, which as anyone who listens to this show knows, black goo is just this 
extraordinary reservoir of profundity in pop culture and uh and it's itself a, a deeply weird phenomenon and so if you're interested in hearing that or diving into all of the other uh, secret exclusive stuff that I, I share with patrons then pop on over to patreon.com slash michael garfield and either way if you are in the uh, giving spirit of the season and have not a penny to your name, then uh, you can still help this show reach a wider audience and continue in its mission to inspire and confound people (laughs) by popping over to Apple podcasts and leaving a gushing five-star review to let all the other heads and freaks know that this is worth their attention. I deeply appreciate it. I appreciate you. And uh, with that, I leave you in the caring and capable hands of Eric Davis as we discuss high weirdness and what it means for us culturally, scientifically, psychologically. Again, this is a a really fun chat, and uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Thanks, and uh, I'll tune in with you after Thanksgiving. I'm not going to spoil it. Let's just uh, jump in. Let's just go. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, it's a pleasure to have you back on Future Fossils. This is twice in one year. I, I feel very blessed. Oh my god, it's all, it's been less than a year. That's it's it's been packed, man. It's been packed. Indeed, it has. It feels um it gets it gets right to the heart of that uh, quality or quantity thing, you know, the the folded imbrication of of number and experience. Just like how, you know, it's like the house that's bigger on the inside than the outside. Anyway. Yeah, I've been feeling that way. I've been feeling that way. I can relate I can relate with that uh, analogy. <laughs> So you you have written a book that, in a way, I, th- I feel like we, we discussed a ton of the th- major themes of high weirdness before I even had a chance to read it. Um, and so with this episode, I'd, I'd really like to, to dive a little bit more into some specific stuff, you know, get a little meta about this and look at this in the broad strokes and, and try and understand... What it, what it is that you're really articulating here philosophically and, and why I think it's so important and how it links to some of these other sort of more normy kind of straight concerns around what is science and what, what can we know and how do we know it? Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, I, I think uh, it's it's a funny thing writing about such outre topics because people sort of assume that you kind of inhabit that space. Uh, and so I'm in this funny position of actually, you know, being party to a lot of mainline, more normy conversations about consciousness and history and how do we think about religion and, you know, academic stuff and scholarly stuff. And I, I think sometimes I seem <laughs> weirder than I am in a way. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of, you know, big think in there, uh, sometimes kind of hiding between the lines, but sometimes uh, explicitly dealt with. You know, that's it's funny that you, you say that specific, our mutual friend Mitch Mignano refers to me as a psychedelic conservative. And I think that there's something in that in this. But let's Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Let's get into this because I, I want to start where you start where you start by introducing people to the weird as a valid domain of academic inquiry and you you say something very early in the book when you're talking about charles fort you say anomaly is a characteristic of the real and i think that this is really key um that you know in order to have the discussion i want to have with you or any discussion about the weird not setting it aside not enfolding it in a protective layer you know like an invasive organism and sort of making it somehow completely different from our reality is really important. Yeah, I mean that was uh, that was part of my my whole approach was to try to sh- sort of show what was what was just next door rather than what was 
super far away and both to kind of, you know, uh, mutate the, the sense of the ordinary uh, and show that it were really just uh, like there's a line from a Mekon song where they say the abyss is close to home. And to kind of crack o- crack that open a little bit from the side of the mundane, and I think that's kind of one way to get into the weird. But another way is to just is to keep the story about the real or reality uh, in play. And I I make it in a, for in my language, and I, I don't think I'm not explicit about it in the book, but I kind of make a difference between real and the real and reality, and that's partly just a kind of academic or scholarly uh, sh- uh, distinction because the idea of the real is really important um, to one of the thinkers that hovers over the book, though, is is very, I think, only mentioned once or twice, which is uh, Jacques Lacan. And he's a complex thinker. There's a, some very annoying things about Lacanian discourse and the whole approach, but there there's some really, really good stuff there. And he's sort of like, to put it the simply as possible, cybernetic Freud. Mm -hmm. And he carries forward Freud's pessimism, but he brings it into a a world with much greater consciousness of language and a much more sort of post-human kind of systematic way of of thinking about the unconscious. And in a way, like articulating the, the, the double bind we're in as subjects of language, of consciousness within societies. And one of his main ideas, which really inspires me, though, again, I didn't, I chose not to go into it uh, in the book. It's more of a wink, wink that if you know the, the discourse, you'll get it. And if you don't, it doesn't matter because it's not instrumental. But it does inform this question of the real and, and, uh, and also the anomalies of the real or around the real. And his basic idea is that kind of I'll just riff on it for a sec. Yes, yeah, is uh, that the wor- the world that we live in conventionally, in terms of what you might call consensus reality, in terms of ordinary language games, in terms of culture and media and memes and all of that world, the world that we're kind of working within as consciousnesses, as we're thinking and processing information, processing cultural signals, expressing ourselves, that whole world is, is, uh, the symbolic. It's kind of like the structure of the, of consensus reality, the, the language and symbolic organization of consensus reality. And he has another category called the imaginary, which we don't really have to talk about now. But then the third category is the real. And the thing that he says about the real is that the real, by definition, is not amenable to symbolization. That means that its very nature is to undermine all of our attempts to symbolize it, to describe it, to own it, to represent it, to you know weave a story about how it's all part of some larger system, whatever kind of integrative yen we have to sort of sustain the symbolic in the face of the real is going to fail at the borders of the real. And then in that sense, and in other senses as well, the real is traumatic. It's fundamentally traumatic. And so we kind of like linger around it, we move around it, there's something we want in it, but we can't ever claim it. And that's just a bind we're in. There's no solution to it. There's no fixing that problem. We just deal with it, meaning individuals, different cultures, different discourses, different ways of being in the world. We deal with it in different ways. And so for me, one of the key things about the real and to insist that that anomaly, that there's something anomalous about the real part of that anomalous real or like quantum physical reality is fundamentally chaotic or fundamentally bizarre demonic or something like that it's just that as we inch closer to the real the way in which it disrupts symbolization consistency coherence uh language identity is going to start to be felt And so you get what Phil Dick called, and this was interestingly a phrase that he got from his dreams, from from the hypnagogic state that he would explore in the 1970s as a as a source of inspiration. And he he would get these little phrases out of 
you know, the mind space of hypnagogy, which is something I've done. I've heard phrases, I've heard lots of music, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting place to be as you consciously surf the edge of dream, you know, like, like Jennifer, my wife talks about in her book, Liminal Dreaming. Anyway, so Dick's doing that. And he gets this wonderful phrase, perturbations of the reality field. And so it's just a wonderful phrase because it's like you can kind of look, so what is a UFO or what is a paranormal experience? One way of saying is that it's just a, a perturbation, an anomaly in the reality field because as we get closer and closer to the real, the degree as close as we can get to it, we're going to start getting effects from it even even before, even if we were sort of not unable to actually experience it or actually represent it or actually understand it or confront it, but we get closer and closer in certain states, in certain situations, definitely in traumatic states, I think probably in some psychoactive states, probably some psychotic states, and maybe, you know, in all sorts of other things that we get, we kind of inch closer to that which fundamentally challenges the symbolic order. And what results from that are perturbations in the reality field, paranormal wiggles, high weirdness. So that's that's kind of one way in of like why I want to keep the term real and also reality um, in play. But for me, the way people talk about reality is is act often more about the symbolic in these sense. They talk they talk about consensus reality, the reality we think we're living in, and that's much more about this symbolic order, uh, which these days, of course, is kind of melting down and fragmenting in all sorts of very bizarre ways. But so that's kind of why I like to make a distinction between the real and reality, because the real to me is is that's the index for the thing that you can't ever get your finger on. Hmm. Yeah, there's actually to to try and stitch a thread through a couple of the things that you just said. One of the reasons I appreciate this book is for more detail and insight into the nature of the revelations that Philip K. Dick was having, you know, this whole, uh, you know, you're like, well, I'm not trying to diagnose the guy like so many people have, have done, but I think it's fairly clear that this fits the, the bill for a, a hypnagogic experience. And even from my own handful of experiences like that, it is, there's something that you, you touch on again and again in this book, which uh, all three, uh, Phil Dick, Terrence McKenna, and, and Bob Wilson all explore this. I, I really like the way that McKenna talks about it, saying that it's that this thing is so strange that it disguises itself as an alien invasion so as not to freak us out, you know, that so as not to traumatize us with its real, you know, and you introduced me to this fabulous word uh, from Lacan, extimacy. And that uh, so much of this is the this message that uh, confounds, you know, the, the, the non-symbolic so often appears in the form of the symbolic because, I mean, you had Eric Wargo on, on your show, and I'm not, I'm not trying to bring a time loops interpretation into this, but I really appreciated how he suggested that if we are having precognitive experiences, the reason we're not recognizing them is because they are clothed in the experiences we've already had. That, that weirdness both defeats our models, you know, introduces the anomaly that unravels what we think we know, but does so in a way, uh, does so by appearing in our own clothing. And there's something really um, that when it comes to really attempting to understand this uh, given the tools available to modernity, it's it's a, it's a nightmare because it makes it very difficult. And I think you've done a really good job in this to differentiate, to start to point to how these experiences, even made as they are out of like a caddis fly case, out of what has personal resonance to us, uh, still reveals a crack in you know the world that we take for granted. So extremacy, yes. Yeah, that's a really good one. That idea that the that the the interior, the inside, is 
is actually the outside. And, and you can take it in different ways. One is that, you know, we have this sort of, you know, very kind of modern idea that there's sort of an inner self and then there's an outer self that interfaces with the world and that when you do dream work or meditate or, uh, you know, do self-exploration, you're, you know, you're going deep within and there's a sense of, of, of intimacy with that process. And it's part of the way that we model who we are. And the idea there is that you dive in and then you dig down and what you find is the outside. And the outside may could mean different things. One thing is you find that you're you you actually are part of culture or that you are already written with ideas or drives or even language itself, which of course isn't yours. It, you're born into it. it. It inscribes you. It stitches you. It stitches your worldview. Uh, and so you can get, you know, very intimate with yourself through language and then, but in some ways you're using this tool from the outside. But it's also like the great outside, the great outdoors. And, you know, meditators discover this. You know, you keep, you keep going in and in and in and you, you discover psychological material and issues from childhood and nebulous feelings that you have kind of haunted you your whole life life without being able to put a name on them. And, and you keep going and you keep going down, you know, you take peeling off the onion and then you get to things that are just, that's not me or it is, but I'm not me anymore or <laughs> whatever that is. And that's also something I think a deep, deep psychonauts experience as well. There's a kind of intimacy and familiarity and even sometimes a sense of like revelatory intimacy, but at the same time, right in there and, and pro maybe even the farther you go, it gets weirder and weirder, more outside, more, or more kind of alien. And, and for me, you know, part of what I'm doing is not creating like a theory of the weird or a system like this is how to approach it or this is how to think about it or or how or introduce a new metaphysics. You know, like Wargo is is you know in some ways doing a, a meta you know a metaphysical move. He's saying no, actually, time is structured differently than we think, and this is why these things are happening. And it's very productive, fascinating, strange way of thinking that really is it, it, you know gets under your skin. And I'm a little bit less interested in that. It's not something I'm particularly drawn to. But what I am interested in in terms of using both language and poetry and concepts is to kind of create a sort of habit or a way of thinking, a way of moving, a directionality in thinking and in experience. And for me, that directionality is definitely outwards, you know, not out of the intimate self, out of the conventional human world, out of language, out of the known, you know, to go to, to push to the outside. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. It's sort of a romantic gesture. In some ways, it's a extraterrestrial or science fiction gesture. But it's also a kind of post human gesture. And that's where it hooks up with other things that, you know, you and I have talked about and other things that we're, we're both interested in is that there's a, a kind of way of like, of refusing to sort of remain within the purely human and to try to lean out or uh, or open up a, a doorway or a portal to something uh, that lies beyond that uh, orientation. And here I'm thinking of a really key distinction that I make in the book between the weird and the uncanny. And this was something that Mark Fisher, a really a great cultural critic, drew attention to and I really appreciated the clarity that he talked about, because in some ways it's very similar. Like you were even talking about how the weirdness, the things come in disguised as the ordinary, you know, and it makes it really difficult to think about because it's just, it seems kind of normal, but something's a little bit off or we have a, a, a strange feeling about it. And that's almost a definition of the uncanny, you know, what's uncanny. Things like dolls are uncanny because they're like sort of human. They're kind of totally normal. Kids have them, no big deal. And yet they have a strange animation to them, a strange sense of, of otherness, but it's very familiar. And that was part of at least Freud's classic definition of the uncanny was that it was, it had to be very homely of the home, of the intimate, of the ordinary, of the domestic, in order for it to become uncanny. You wouldn't have something that's just completely bizarre and extraterrestrial. That's not uncanny. In, in a lot of ways, the feelings that we talk about as being uncanny are, are, are similar, overlap with feelings associated with the weird. It's also kind of close to home. Uh, it's something, you know, we use the term a lot to just talk about strange things in our ordinary days. You know, we're not talking about, you know, 
totally far out and a lot of weird fiction, even though it has supernatural elements in it, 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 part of what makes it weird fiction and not pure fantasy is that it takes place kind of closer to a realism, to a realist way of experiencing or even just realist genre of, of writing, uh, writing literature. But there's a key distinction between the uncanny and the weird that, that Fisher makes that, that supports this thing I'm talking about, the outside, is that at least in terms of the way psychoanalysis uses the term, the uncanny points within. It points to the family drama, the Oedipus complex, the repressed drive, and in Freud's sense, ultimately the death drive, which is how he called the strange tropism we have, you know, towards repetition and uh, kind of non-productive behaviors. Um, he identified as the death drive and he associated with, with the uncanny, but it's all about internal, the kind of domestic drama of our individual psyches. But the weird points out. The weird is in the world, or beyond the world as we know it. It's in the outside. It's in the beyond. It's in the other. And so even though the feelings and the vibrations and even the kind of literature or movies associated with the uncanny overlap the kind of space of the weird, the weird has this exteriority quality, this extimate quality. We recognize something familiar in it precisely because deep in our most familiar cores – there is this sort of fold or trace or transport point to to the outside. Yeah, you know, you said in your last episode of Expanding Mind before your break for this book tour, etc., uh, maybe the true weird is about embracing the banal. The actual texture of daily life right now is weird. And I, I, was, I just had uh, the hosts of Weird Studies I recorded an episode of Future Fossils with them, and that's sort of where it came to, is that this is more like that uh, Timothy Morton or, or Graham Harmon post-Heideggerian thing about not being able to to touch the actual table in some sense. I, I, I want to twist on this just a little bit, because you say a lot of really excellent stuff about the practice of science. There's a section in this book where you say, why should we think of these others as other when they come from loops of the self? A voice in the head, perhaps no different from the other scripts our minds endlessly process, can appear as a teacher from beyond, writing a Mobius strip that crosses and confuses inside and out. There may be no reason to believe in this incorporeal entity, but we may have no choice but to listen. And there's something, there's something in this about the way that these experiences capture people and i think you know the, to to write this book from within jeff kripal's religious studies rice university zone to inquire into in what ways the experiences of these authors and others like them are and are not religious you seem a whole lot less satisfied with just placing them in that basket and and i think that's worth uh, unpacking a little yeah, that's fine. That's a that's a, a good way into the stuff. I mean, initially, I I was sort of thinking about these things in, more continuously with the problem of religious experience. I mean, it's a big thing inside religious studies: is what is religious experience? What makes an experience religious? How can we even talk about such a thing? Is it just a is it just a social construction? What would be essentially religious about experience? Blah 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 blah. It's a huge often tedious, you know, problem that that's been going. So I kind of saw what I what I was doing as being in the in the stream of that. And you get some of that discussion early on in the introduction where I kind of setting up some of my methodology and things. But as I was going farther, I I started to feel that if there was something un unusual or novel about the 70s, or about the counterculture, or even more broadly, let's say the modern Bohemia or modi modern Bohemian spirituality. You know, maybe stretching it back to the the turn of the previous century and uh, the you know decadent romantics and the early experiments. You know, like Crowley's experiments with with uh, peyote and you know that era. That there's something else going on, and it and it, it partly has to do with science. Uh, and the way in which science gets woven into these fantasies and visions and cosmologies and, and new models. 
but also increasingly the role of fiction and the acknowledged role of fiction. Because, I mean, I remember having a conversation with with Jeffrey Kripal about uh, a book by Carol Cusack called Invented Religions. And it's a phrase, you know, as religious studies, people are really interested in these kind of concocted religions like Jediism or Church of the Subgenius or Discordianism, which I talk a lot about in High Weirdness. And these are interesting because most religions don't present themselves as being invented. And so, well, how do we talk about these? Some people call them parody religions, religions, or you know, there's different ways that people are 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 talking about these things. So, I, I, we were talking about this book, Invented Religions, and Kripal just laughing. He says, "Well, they're all invented, you know." So, in some sense, the problem of fiction goes to the heart of just the whole question about religion, because and there's always fictions in the stories and how they get developed. And even if individuals have extraordinary experiences of the true nature of reality, once they open their mouths, it sort of becomes fiction. And then a lot of what sustains religions over centuries you know, take the form of fictions, fictions that work, fictions that are inscribed with symbols and imagery, you know, we can call them mythology if you prefer. But something else happens at this time in the 70s where, again, these kind of self-conscious fictions, these intentional fictions begin to have a life of their own and take off and begin to sort of impact people's experience and the way they're thinking about their experience really directly. And and that consciousness, the self-consciousness about fictionality, for example, it's in the early 70s, literally when you first find multiple groups of people or individuals talking about how you can do real occult rituals using H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos. <laughs> you know, that's sort of an extreme example of like, hey, you can really do a authentic, whatever that means, powerful, transformative, non-ordinary ritual using these things that come from pulp magazines. There's something in that that, to, to my mind, is a shift. Uh, it, it says something about our postmodern condition. It says something about the 70s. But it also, again, takes us a little farther away from just religious experience. There's something else going on. So I increasingly saw high weirdness and the extraordinary experiences I was writing about as these novel assemblages, like collages of different streams of human culture and human experience, science, fiction, Science fiction, religion, esotericism, drug culture, bohemia, hedonism, all of these things were kind of woven together and they staged, in a sense, different kinds of experiences. I think, you know, kinds of experiences that people at Burning Man, for example, would find much more recognizable. You know, in some sense, like Burning Man and the spirituality of Burning Man, if you want to call it that, the the invention of new subjectivities, the development of an ecstatic culture at this sort of end stage of of capitalism and and, and modern mythology, in a way, is kind of a, a later iteration of the same kind of things that I sort of saw in the 70s. So after a certain point, there really wasn't uh, it wasn't too useful to talk about religious or religion or religious experience, you know, mysticism had made more sense. But even there, you know, a lot of times mysticism is is associated with kind of states of oneness, states of kind of like, you know, abstract totality, the ineffable. It becomes the more visual it is, the more embodied, the more interpersonal the experience, the less it's sort of marked as like mystical, at least in the modern sense of the term. Of course, there's many different definitions of mysticism and what it is. But I guess I was talking about something that's a little more like visionary, you know, visionary experience, visionary poets, you know, William Blake, like more in that kind of current. Uh, but I, I, I thought that I wanted to emphasize that there was something new going on here. So I, I really wanted to highlight the, the high weirdness as a way into something that was different in a way. Yeah, the you know we we did touch on operationalized fictions when you were on uh, episode ninety nine earlier this year, and that there's something in that that I think is really juicy and easy to grasp about all of this in a way, sort of, <laughs> even as it eludes us. Um, 
you know, I think this is a real concrete example that we know that even if the doctor tells you it's a placebo, it's still going to work. Like the placebo effect still happens. And there's also, um, I just learned recently that even if you've been exposed to a stereotype that you do not believe yourself to hold, if you have been exposed to a racist stereotype or whatever, that it informs the implicit biases that we carry. And so this, I think, links us to your discussion of uh, Amelie Gomar, if I'm saying that right, and, and Bruno Latour, and their thoughts about uh, material agency in the practice of science. You know, like how, as you put it, scientific experiments are not performed by humans alone, that there's this, this ecosystem of agents, including, as you, you point to again and again, with Terrence McKenna and with Bob Wilson, the drugs as active participants in the enactment of their effects. So there's this something you're pointing beyond uh, created or discovered at the same time you're pointing beyond subject and object into this post-human condition where we're giving more agency and possibly even interiority to these things that we have thought of as inanimate objects around us. And I know that you've given a bunch of talks on, on reanimism, but I think like this specifically you know, when we're talking about ways it is like and unlike the visionary experience, you know, like the burning bush talking to Moses or, you know, the the uh, dorm room mushroom trip where you feel like the mug that you're staring at is becoming conscious through you. Anyway, I'd, I'd love to hear you dig a little into how this changes the way that we think about about the process of discovery and the implications of this for our condition. Yeah, that's those are some big questions, and and I you know I would like to say I, I felt like I was completely on top of my ideas here, and in some ways almost as an example of the very thing we're talking about. You know, the thing about thinking is that sometimes it's really clear the way you are actively putting things together or actively exploring, but then sometimes it seems as you're as if you are almost kind of taken over by an idea. And then the idea has stuff it wants to do, and you just become the kind of connector or, or vehicle for it. And I don't mean it in just like a meme sense, or, or even in the sense you're saying that we get exposed to a racist joke, and we don't, we're not racist, and yet it changes our reactivity because somehow, on some level, we're programmable. You know, I'm, th I'm thinking about what it actually it means to think. Like it means to think is to is to be in relation with enigmas that have something to say that that are going to point you in directions or are going to problematize things that had been easy for you to think about before. And then there you are, you have to kind of deal with this new problem you didn't expect it. And you know, so I'm 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 allowing that to happen through a lot of the books. So let's get let's talk about the issue of like of drugs. So there's sort of two ways to think about it. You know, I mentioned before how there's a really robust language about religious experience in religious studies. And some of it is very reductive, reductionist. What it says is like, yeah, yeah, something happens, you know, biophysically, you have a you have a, a stroke or some kind of seizure or spasm in the nervous system. And it has some you know, cog it, re it registers in consciousness cognitively. And then what people do is that they reach into their already prepared storehouse of ideas and scripts f about religion, about ecstatic experience, about the spirit. And then they, in real time, weave those stories together as a way of explaining or capturing or or adding some sense to these experiences that are that are uh, it, quote unquote essentially biophysical in other words we're projecting using our the cultural materials we've already grown up with that are in our culture so people who are christians are more likely to see mary and people who are hindus are going to see shiva or whatever those are simplistic examples, but you can actually, you know, explain a lot of stuff that happens to people through this kind of priming is a way we would think about it in sort of psychological language that we're, we're surrounded by priming and um, then that could be kind of kind of comes real. And there's a degree to which that's true. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind as we look at 
extraordinary experience, as we look at religious experience, psychedelic experience, and, and I do a lot of that. I, I show how some of the things that Phil Dick and Robert Anton Wilson and Terrence McKenna are thinking really have to do with what they were reading before, with ideas that they came up with themselves, and almost like those ideas using the, the powerful uh, palette of uh, altered states of consciousness can then create these incredibly rich and elaborated synthetic expressions of these ideas that were kind of already in the system. It's just the it's a basic idea in cognitive science. You know, the brain is always modeling the next move in reality, and in an altered state situation, those models go draw from the deepest wells. You know, of mythology and mysticism and religion and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Great. All fine and well. The problem is, is that there's distinct limitations to this view, and uh, they have to do with novelty. One of them is how do you explain people who are utterly secular, brought up in a secular environment, are completely secular in their attitudes and life experiences? Yeah, they're in a culture that has religious things in it, but they're they're not they know about them. They have real, they've, they've just gotten the lightest exposure to them. And then they have like a full blown religious experience on the natch. So where does that come from? You know, if you're if you're one of these reductionist types. It's very difficult to explain novelty beyond a certain level. It's true of reductionism in general. It's very difficult to explain novelty. Like even if you're like into evolutionary psychology you know, you're always explaining away things in terms of these basic conditions and these basic conflicts and, you know, the need to reproduce the genes and blah, 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 blah. And you're like, great, these are really sharp. Some of them seem bitterly true. And yet it's extremely difficult to explain creativity and novelty in a lot of these uh, languages. And that's true for this kind of reductionist language about mystical experience. It's also kind of true about psychedelics. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, well, you know, when you take LSD now, you know what it means to take LSD, even if you've never had it before. I mean, you know, the Grateful Dead, you know, the swirly fractals, you know that it's goofy. You've seen, you know, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and 50 other movies that were inspired by by LSD. And moreover, when you go into LSD and there's, you know, certain maybe basic phenomenological features of the LSD experience, like on a, on a really basic level, there maybe are these sort of universal features. I, I'm not really sure if that's true, but let's just say there are, that the particular flesh they're going to take is already rich with history. So, for example, I remember the last time I took LSD, there was I, I was going to like a familiar kind of patterned space and I was kind of like oh yeah I forgot about this kind of part of LSD and there was a whole period of the trip where like it was all in sort of 60s iconography it was all like you know Fillmore East uh, poster art and you know you know looking like the cover of albums from that period that kind of art nouveau old west organicism and excess and the kind of colors the op art colors like there was a whole language of psychedelic experience that was circulated through material objects and aesthetic objects in the 60s and there was a part it was like there was a part of LSD space that was that's what that was it was like it was constituted as this kind of 1960s early 70s aesthetic universe. So is that there when Albert Hoffman, you know, takes it for the first time? No, I don't think so. I think that in some ways, acid space probably is to some degree, historical, archaeological, there are layers to it, you can stumble in to places that other people have been to some degree, not because there's some mystical collective consciousness plane of reality, but just because the culture itself circulates certain nodes or habits of perception. But let's go back to Hoffman's first trip. Something happens. What happens? This has never happened before in the history of humankind. I mean, yes, ecstatic experiences happen, but he doesn't know that. He, he's poisoned. He's Maybe he's dying. And indeed, he experiences a kind of what well, later on you see as a classic psychedelic death and rebirth experience. He sees witches, he gets freaked out, he, you know, there's all sorts of elements of it that have this kind of occult quality that you're like, well, where does that come from? It's just his imagination kind of making it up on the fly? Maybe, maybe. Or maybe the molecule has something to say. 
that the molecule is not a blank slate. And the idea that what human beings do is go around in a blank slate universe where everything is a blank slate and projects meaning. That's a classic idea. Oh, you're projecting. You're projecting meaning. The thing itself has no meaning. has nothing to say. It's mute. It's empty. It's without qualities. It's without values. It all comes from human beings projecting the shit everywhere all the time. And while I think it's important to be aware of projection, it's definitely part of what happens, I increasingly believe that we're actually in a pluriverse of entities, agents, processes, realities, things, dimensions, echoes, patterns, all of which to some extent have something to say or some way of responding or limiting or engaging with the action of human beings. And so when you bring that into psychedelics, then what are you talking about? Well, you're talking about that there's no psychedelic experience without a metabolic relationship with an actual physical material as well as energetic and God knows what other dimensions there are to it compound, you know, and that there, you, there, it does, like what is a, psych, a psychedelic compound sitting on the shelf is not psychedelic. It's a compound sitting on a shelf. It, it's in the interaction, and Sasha Shulgin talks about this. It's in the interaction that you explore and discover its phenomenological features. And this is part of science. Shulgin is speaking as a scientist when he says this. But he also recognizes that there's a loop involved because the human experience then is the ground upon which the phenomenological is expressed, so you lose the subject, the clear line between subject and object, and classic, the classical scientific model is not available. So then you're, it's like, oh shit, I thought we were doing science here. Oh no, we can't actually do that kind of science. You can't actually do psychedelic science with a real placebo, with a real control group. All you can do is you kind of fudge it. Well, let's give them niacin. Or you can't get, create a psychedelic experience in a lab where there's no environmental suggestions or priming. Like, if you, well, what is the psychedelic experience pure? What's a pure psychedelic experience? Well, you got to take a human being, because there's no psychedelic experience without a human being reporting it. I mean, maybe it happens to animals, but it's tough. So we've got to take a human being. They've never taken it before. They've never had any psychedelic experience before. Let's try to be that they don't know anything about religion. They don't know anything about hippies. They don't know anything about Jimi Hendrix. You know, whatever. You get this ideal subject. But then you still have a problem, which is you're like, where and in what way do you give them the drug? Like, is it in a pill? Is it is it in a – why don't you put it on a piece of paper with a big smiley face on it? Oh, well, no, that would be too – that, that's too much of an environmental prime, so we'll, we'll, we'll just use a, a plain white pill. Well, but that's a plain white pill. That's another cultural signifier. <laughs> oh, we'll just use some empty water. Oh, that, okay, that won't work. Well, okay, we get into them somehow. We sneak up on them. But where are they sitting? Are they in a, a white cube? Oh, well, then they're in a white cube world. Well, are they in a doctor's office? Then they're a doctor's office. Is there a rose on the table? Well, there's a rose on the table. Oh, let's give them music. That'll help. Well, what kind of music are you going to give them? You going to give them Beethoven? Nine Inch Nails, Ravi Shankar, there's no way out. There's no way out of environmental effects on psychedelic experience, both in terms of set and setting and in terms of whatever mysterious multiplicities lie in the material itself. So there's no way to do capital S science with psychedelics, despite the fact that they are material molecules that reliably have a certain kind of metabolic arc and can be explained in terms of how they are bro broken down in the body and even light up certain regions of the brain, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, I mean, I think it's kind of wonderful, but to me, that's part of where the weird is. Like the weird is in that, is in that way that you can't get out of the loop. And it's sort of claustrophobic. It's kind of frustrating almost like you want to get out of the loop, but you can't get out of the loop because we're in the loop and culture is a loop and maybe human subjectivity is a loop. And we want to repress it. We want to insist that we can get back to some crisp subject-object divide. 
because it makes us feel good and because we like science. And I like science. I love science. I like science even more than I used to. You know, I feel like in some general sense, I'm, you know, I'm on the science team, even though it might not look like it because I'm <laughs> also very interested in, in, you know, chaos and the mystery. And um, I'm not a reductionist. This is an MIT Press book, for God's sake. It's true. Well, that's why I was one of the reasons I was so chuffed, as the British say, to be on MIT Press, because I've read MIT Press books since I was in college, and I always associated with the, 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 like, the most reputable scholarly press that was also kind of, kind of cyberpunk. <laughs> you know, they would do weird science things and edgy things, and, you know, Manuel Delanda and, you know, stuff like that. So I was, I was really happy to, I think it's the perfect place to be in that sense, because I am really influenced by science and technology studies. I think science and technology studies is probably the best, it's better than religious studies as a way to talk about psychedelics and a lot of aspects of modern cybernetic culture, technological culture, media culture. So in a way, I feel very much of that stream. I'm just kind of constantly drawn to this sort of mysterious outside that that brings me into a, a into an enig enigmatic place but that's sort of what i think psychedelics do yeah you know first of all ole and uh second of all i'm really glad that you brought up the metabolism piece of this uh i want to put a pin in that actually because because i want to get to something else that you were talking about here naturally i'm reading your book through the lens of working at the santa fe institute and being immersed in this conversation about information and adaptive systems and networks and you you have this idea this concept of the psychogenic networks that implicate us in this that we've been we've been dancing around that specific phrase uh, for this discussion so far but this notion that that beings of fiction as you put it shape our subjectivity by occupying prominent nodes of the psychogenic networks that implicate us. That is the pact they offer us. They shape ourselves or at least entertain them in exchange for the attention we return to them. And this gets to, you know, you, you cite Richard Doyle in this book. His Darwin's Pharmacy is largely about how information consumes attention and that this folded multi multiplicative landscape that you're you're describing here is a landscape uh it's like it's an attention manifold and that that when we're talking about like a, a multiplication of reality through these enactments or you know you quote james the simplest bits of immediate experience are their own others and so this this way that much like uh C C cesar hidalgo uh, at mit wrote a book, you know, Why Information Grows, that there seems to be this sense in which um, we can't get away, that the loop that you're talking about here is in part that we can't get away from being um, servants of this dissipative metabolic process that is maximizing entropy. Like, this is a way of talking about this, but this notion that, you know, the, the, the river basin that is able to divide itself into more and more tributaries is more energetically effective or efficient. And that just in general, what we're dealing with here, the reason that this is so difficult to pin down is that it continues to proliferate, that it, that it has in its nature a not just plural, but multiplying aspect the of it that the comes, accelerating quality yeah that it not, that it's accelerating precisely because the psychogenic network is, is the like maybe the way that we would talk about this thing in the third person you know in an attempt to to like objectify this um that that network grows upon itself feeds upon the attention that it provides itself Yes, I see what you what you're getting at now. I mean, it's it's interesting how we I mean, it's just interesting that shift that what happens when we start to say things like the network feeds itself or, you know, the network grows and the net or, or it, it, we, we get a sense of this kind of, uh, again, a kind of liveliness, even animism to these abstract non human, but but in some sense, humanly constructed processes but then they're sort of you know out out of out of our hands and what is it like to 
be in relationship with that, particularly when if attention is the fuel or one of the major fuels that we're like everywhere we turn, we're producing self-fulfilling prophecies. And this is a really interesting thing, particularly now when attention is being targeted so intensely and that the whole space of culture is being weaponized and, and become much more sticky and and, you know, really, uh, the whole thing about the Internet from the get-go is always a, a kind of game of, of grabbing attention and, and learning how to make things sticky and what are the best ways to capture people's attention. And, you know, but doing it on a, on a more and more micro level where it's just down to the, the nanosecond and the gestures of the eyes across the screen. And it's such a refined technical uh, technical level, but there's still something that's desired there, this thing, this attention. And it really does have a, have a curious power to grow things, fictions, patterns, memes, behaviors, and to sort of lend them more and more reality. They thicken in a weird way. They, they coagulate. And as they do, uh, they become more powerful and maybe more magnetic and, and more people are drawn to them. And we're kind of aware that we're in something like that, but we don't really know how to keep the reins in a way. Like we're, we're it's a bucking bronco, and and some people actually want to turn it into, uh, you know, a, a mounted warrior. You know, they want to like abuse it. You know, use it to shape reality and to man, you know, to get what they want and to to hurt the enemy. And some of us are just trying to figure out like how do we even think on top of this thing do we is it it, maybe it's better to just like hold on to the subject object science mode as much as we possibly can because it's like it prevents the intensity of the loop of the self-awareness about where we're laying you know our attention here i wanted i wanted to bring up and it's just an example of another example of this this kind of living fiction thing it's not that technical but it's still fascinating you know, the placebo that works anyway is, and I, I mentioned in the, the Robert Anton Wilson section is this Philip experiment from the early 70s. Again, I think not not coincidentally, where there was a group of, you know, university educated, reasonably skeptical people who were interested in the paranormal and were exploring it on their own as a kind of group, club. You know, and so they weren't hardcore believers. They weren't hardcore, skept- you know, hardcore what we now think of skeptics, but they were, you know, critical thinkers. So they were like, well, hey, you know, and they were doing seances and they would get effects like the table would kind of rattle a little bit or their hands would move or, you know, I don't know if they were using Ouija boards, but, you know, they were getting some effects in these kind of seance like situations without really anybody like being the guru or being the one who's like, I am a medium, you know, that no, nobody like that. It was just people who were kind of experimenting basically. And they say, Hey, let's, let's make up a spirit. And they made up a spirit, Philip. They, you know, they would find things that happened to him in his life and da da da, that was personality. And then they tried to contact him. Oh, Philip, let's con, you know, da da da, can you go? And then, they contacted this figure and with a Ouija board, he was communicating to them and he was elaborating his own story. And, you know, and they found that like there were certain conditions that made it more difficult to communicate and certain ones that were better. If they took him too seriously, he tended to go away. So it was actually helpful for them to have a little bit of a, a kind of distance on him. And there were certain things that would piss him off. So basically, they created a thought form, an, an egregore, you would say, in, in occult language, and it had a kind of life of its own. They knew it was a construct, but it was using their unconscious, implanting, becoming part, inhabiting their collective. Well, you know, it's really hard to say exactly where it was happening. And work was established that enabled Philip to manifest. But it definitely involved both attention and this idea of the psychogenic network, the idea that, again, it's the extimate thing, that if you go into your interior, into your dreams, into your primal fantasies and fears, that all of that stuff is actually written with materials that come from the outside, that come from TV shows, from stories your mom told you, from you know physical experiences you had when you were a kid, that there isn't an inside that's somehow inviolate and separate from the outside, and that we're kind of, our insides are written with sort of warped forms 
of the outside. And so by tracking the outside, it's not just that you can trace these things back to historical circumstances, it's that you start to get a feel for how that inside, outside, that Mobius loop operates. And then at some point in your discussion or in your exploration, you realize that you're in it too. (laughs) You know, that high weirdness is also a loop, that I'm in a loop, that I'm playing with loops, that I'm in some sense passing them on or passing on ideas, ways of thinking, ways of experiencing that have come to me through these researches that have come to me partly through psychedelics and partly through the psychedelics, the psychedelic nature of thought and thinking and encountering texts and letting texts work on you, letting texts sort of take over with their own ideas and plans and plots, their own networks of connection um, that you're in some sense allowing to work within you. So it's this, it's a very strange, it's, it's like this sort of surfing thing where you're partly in control and you're partly not, partly not in control. So then the question is, what's our responsibility there? Are we just going to give in? No. Are we just going to follow anything that seems cool? That seems nihilistic and wrong. Can we do science in the old classic sense? I'm not sure, really. Maybe in some domains, sure, but not in these kind of cultural, paranormal, edge-walking, dream-haunted, macabre, (laughs) bizarre, ecstatic, erotic, sticky, icky zones. I don't think there's a science of that that's enabled because part of the effects we're talking about are precisely when the subject-object breaks down and we realize that we're inside of these loops where we can't make clear distinctions between quantities that we can understand analytically and quantities that we just see as sort of floating human values that actually they're really deeply enmeshed in a way that that takes away the clarity and and kind of eagle eye perspective that science at least pretend you know pretends to provide and does provide for some kinds of questions mm, you know in in describing this you're reminding me of a passage in you're describing Philip K. Dick's exegesis, talking about it as a self producing vortex. And I don't think I told you this yet, but right as I started reading this book, I had the the uh, inclination to post a picture of me with my infant daughter on my lap reading your book. And then I got to the Phil Dick section of the book and the, the full two page spread photo introducing that section is Phil Dick with his baby on his lap reading a book. And it it was one of these things where I, anyway, that's, it was, I I would be surprised if you didn't have a profusion of people reporting that this book is doing exactly what you're describing, that it's launching people into this, this kind of vortex. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel, yeah. I, I mean, that's where I sort of talk about how, I mean, in a way that's the most vulnerable conversation I have about the book, and you know, as people are are saying things like that, and whether they're specific kind of synchronicity like experiences or just general kind of warps in the in the mind, that was my intention. And but it would be kind of pretentious to talk about it beforehand. But <laughs> now that it's out there, I, I you know, it's not that I don't want I don't want to say I feel guilty exactly but i i there there's a sense of like well what did you what were you actually doing here you know and 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 i mean that in the sense that like let's just take phil philip dick i mean he was the person in the book that has been with me the longest i started to read him he wrote my university thesis senior thesis on on phil dick it was called uh, philip k dick's postmodern gnosis and this was in 1988 so this guy's been with me for a long time and one of the things you can say about Phil Dick is that, you know, he's a profoundly traumatized cat, and some of his material, or even within any given book, is really depressing. And there was a period where I hadn't read him for years, and I reread books that had just jazzed me when I first read them. I mean, they were just like, wow, you know, like, amazing. He's, one of my, he's my favorite. And I read it again, and I went, whoa, this is so disturbed. And I could see my own disturbance in my attraction, you know, to Phil Dick and the sense that there was something not just about the text. I mean, he was certainly wrestled with pathology his whole life, 
His experience, his, his great mystical religious experience, is partly pathological. His writing is kind of pathological, not just the, not so much the the, the fiction that he publishes, but the exegesis, this vortex. I mean, a lot of it is just this totally paranoid crap, like it's nothing you'd ever want to read. And desperate and disturbed and and obsessive and incredibly obsessive, you know, so it's, he's a, he's a hurting pup in some ways. And yet he was so important to me. So I'm like, what is that? Like, wh- what in, is this because it felt, you know, it fed something in me? Is this because it got into me somehow? And I, I, it gave me something. And so then I sort of carried it forward and like propagated it, you know, and he uses all those metaphors. He talks about the Holy Spirit, the Gnostic Holy Spirit as being this kind of plasmate that affect that infects people and it goes through the text so it's like he's it's like he's having an experience of the text being infused with something cosmic but kind of weird and not altogether healthy but also sort of spiritual and not really clear what it is exactly and then i'm reading that and i'm picking it up and i'm connecting it with postmodern literature and gnosticism and all this stuff and i keep it i keep going forward and all these years later you know, I'm writing something that has that crackle to it in some way. And it was something I wanted to do. And it's only for some people, like only some people will pick up on it. Other people, it's like either kind of just an interesting book or a bit much to take. I don't really need that much on uh, Terrence McKenna. You know, we're going to put it down. But for those people, and there's not a few of them, it's not only going to be like a gas or even a mind fuck, but it's going to be lively in that way that we've been talking about in the whole conversation. And I'm not even really sure what that is. What is that life that's being passed on? Is it good? Does it help? Uh, it does. It is initiatory. Do you sometimes want to go back? <laughs> sure. Can you go back? Not exactly. Sort of. You can let it alone for a while and move on to other things. People do that. Uh, I never did. I remain connected and even obliged in some ways to a lot of the weird stuff and experiences and books and things that happened to me when I was much younger. I'm, I'm not sure why I, I have that sense of continuity, but I'm aware that, that in writing about these things, I am now writing in, in the stream that I'm writing about, that the book is a highly weird book. <laughs> well, you, to talk about that invocation or enactment of entities. And I think it's worth noting, I think this story that you brought up about Philip, although you don't mention it in this book, ends kind of awkwardly, tragically with this egregore that they've invoked begging for death or annihilation. Uh, they talk about this on Weird Studies again, like that, that if I'm getting this right, they, they were seeking an impossible figure. So it's someone from before the age of cars that is like a, a truck driver or something. Like I forget the precise details, but it's historically impossible. And it eventually creates a, um, or so the story goes, it creates a psychic rift within this this being and so you see it's not just the trauma of the conventional subject it's the trauma of our productions of these wow uh, you know the- oh that's interesting you know I, I mean i read the book i maybe either i didn't pick that up or that's additional material i'll have to listen to the weird studies one where they go into it i don't think i've heard that one that was the one on hyperstition okay yeah 36 yeah but okay so you're talking to to borrow phrases from the middle and the beginning of the book the tipping point between fantastic appearances and impossible objects. And then very early you say, a crucial feature of high weirdness. It may start out as a game, but it ends up as a whole world. That Again, it's, it's like, um, you know, when you think about like the, the butterfly effect in chaotic systems and path dependency or the dependence on the initial conditions, that like a glance at the wrong Lovecraftian text is enough to like initiate this or to catalyze this chain reaction that ends up, you know, devouring your, your sanity. (laughs) I want to, I want to dog leg here. I want to bring up something that was haunting me kind of throughout the whole book. And we've skipped like a stone across this, but I, I think this really speaks to beyond issues of like the reproducibility of an experiment or the, the ability to cleanly parse a subject and object. I, I stumbled on a paper at the Santa Fe Institute that was written by some of the professors there back in 99 
on optimal encoding. Like how do you how do you perfectly encrypt a message or compress it so that it it takes up the fewest number of of bits, right? And what these authors came up with was that the optimally encoded message is indistinguishable from black body radiation. That it, it's it's impossible to tell the difference between what you might consider like a transcendental intelligence communicating with you <laughs> and noise. And that th there's something, you know, to reach it to this theme that you touched throughout the book, that the way that the weird, you know, and again, at the beginning of our conversation, the way that the weird appears in the trash stratum, you know, that the way that the way that it appears in the absurd sci-fi references and so on, it's impossible to know really whether this message, this op, you know, wh whether what you're actually experiencing is just noise or whether it's a message so precise and targeted that no one else can understand. And maybe this is <laughs> oddly making this kind of a mundane discussion, but like Fermi's paradox, you know, this, this question of where, where is the alien? Rachel Armstrong, architect, wants to say any sufficiently advanced technology or civilization is indistinguishable from nature. Edward Snowden suggested that sufficiently advanced encryption is indistinguishable from the cosmic background radiation. Mm. And so there's, there's um, again, to the, to the information theory dimension of this. And I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a tangent, but it, I just, I had to bring it up because it's, like I said, it's been, it's been bugging me this whole time that I think that we've, we've really hit a point where there's nowhere to go from here. Nowhere obvious. <laughs> nowhere obvious for sure. And, you know, that whole thing about noise that I used to be really obsessed with that, that quality. And there, there's really in, in that's an, a fascinating part of Phil Dick too, of the fictions and the exegesis in 2374, but is the role of, of, of noise in both, and, and, and even in specifically like kind of technical situations where like they're getting a message from the gods and it gets garbled or in the divine invasion, the way that they connect with this kind of representative of, of the local god is the way in which the sounds in the fiddler in the roof soundtrack, the words get transposed through this, and, and you're like, is that noise? Was that a distortion? Or was it actually an, another order of information in the way that noise not only can disguise sense information, but that it can catalyze it? That if you add noise, like actual noise, into a system, the system will is sometimes forced to reorganize in a way that will produce some new value or some new information. So there's something extremely productive about noise. And it's a great question from a religious or spiritual point of view. It's like, what's the spiritual role of noise? Of like, and is, is that like, you know, noise as what's not a message, noise as what's random, chaotic, you know, the sheer ferocity of meaninglessness, you know, but yet it has some kind of meaning. It fits into the picture somehow. And, you know, to me, like philosophy, person, you know, less like abstract ph philosophical systems, but personal philosophies or value systems or religion or spirituality that doesn't make place for meaninglessness, that are always about holding on to meaning and sh fetishizing meaning and making sure that we hold on to meaning and meaning, that to me, that's, that's not very productive. That's when you start to dance with noise, which in, in the way that I'm using it metaphorically is kind of like meaninglessness, lack of information, total randomness, un, you know, unpredictability and therefore predictably unpredictable or all the kind of paradoxes you get into around the edge of information theory and the nature of noise. Nonetheless, they, it, it seems like really pretty. And you see that very much in, in Phil Dick's work. But at the same time, it means that the, uh, the revelation is always relativized. And that's part of the like key element. I could have I could have emphasized that more in the book. Key aspect of once we're in this cybernetic situation, then not only do we not know is that noise or is that a signal, is this cosmic background radiation or is it actually, you know, advanced e extraterrestrial signaling? Is that even when you do get a message, you're like, that's a message. <laughs> you don't get to know. <laughs> 
because you, you you've kind of sh- you've kind of knocked out that that realm of certainty that in the past would have said oh what you're thinking is true what you're thinking is like so you've had an encounter with god and then you come down off the hill and you open your mouth and you start talking and you're like that's what god told me and now we're like you still can go to the mountain you still can have a revelatory experience that blows your mind and you come down off the the mountain and if you've been paying attention you open your mouth and you go well i don't really know what's going on but I, it seems like it might be like this like all you get is like a hypothesis and i talk about this in, in actually one of the my favorite parts to research in the book was comparing phil dick's exegesis to the the um memoirs of my nervous illness by uh daniel paul schraber who was sort of the first guy who was crazy no doubt who wrote extensively about being crazy in a way that had some distance from it. So it wasn't like just a total crank document, but he was also talking about things that were that were psychotic. And there were interesting, a lot of interesting similarities with Phil Dick. And one of the features that a really great uh, religious scholar pointed out in some work on Schreber, who's mostly dealt with from a psychoanalytic point of view, not from a religious studies point of view, but this guy was like saying, Schreber initiates a new sensibility into religious and visionary experience because, and in this he shares with Phil Dick, even though there's a cosmic dimension to his thought, the cosmos is still physical, which means that communication in this cosmos is still physical. It proceeds through rays in the example of Schreber or in Phil Dick's universe. There's there's like transmissions from radio satellites. The it's a physical, yeah. yeah, a beam. So it's a physical universe that's using material forces to communicate information. So what that also means, also entails, is that there's noise. And so even though Schreber is having these revelatory experiences, just like Phil Dick, No question that revelation was happening to these guys. They still realized they didn't really know what the message was because they were, did I get it right? I'm not sure. There could have been something obstructing the ray. I've gotten different ones. I don't know. So what what the point he makes, and this relates to earlier comments about science, is that while they had these revelatory experiences, the most they can say are hypotheses. They most they can say is well, and that's what the that's what Phil Dick does in the exegesis. It's just one hypothesis of it or another about well, maybe the cosmos is actually these two principles that have been warring, and one of them's true and one of them's false. Or maybe it's that there's actually just one reality and this you know whatever, and they go on and on and on and on and on, and on like hypothesis after hypothesis after hypothesis, and the content of them doesn't matter so much. I mean, they're in, it's interesting. But the point here is that they take the form of a hypothesis. But, you know, a visionary, a a religious visionary in the 14th century was not likely doing that. They were saying, this is what I saw. Mm. There was certainty. There was conviction in a way that this particular stream of kind of modern or postmodern, if you want to, later on, spirituality has within it that question about meaning or the the question about epistemology or uh, something like skepticism or something like doubt in the very machine that's nonetheless producing visionary experiences and visionary statements. And this is true of Terrence McKenna and Robert Anton Wilson and Philip K. Dick in different ways. And they're inconsistent. Sometimes they make prophetic claims. You know, Crowley had the same thing. You know, Crowley was very skeptical and scientific about a lot of magic and and recognized that you these weren't like capital T truth claims. And at the same time, he thought he was a messiah and that he had received a revelation. You know, there's this weird mixtures of things that we find. But there is something new that enters into these religious or cosmic experiences that has a quality of doubt or reflexivity to it. And it's really the loop again. It's like, I only know so much about what I know, so I can't really claim it. And that's, the, in a way, the tragedy of Phil Dick's experiences, that he went through all this stuff. Sometimes it was great. Sometimes it was suffering. It shook him up big time. But he never really got, like, he could never really settle on what it meant. So in a way, it's it, it, it's a bit, uh, even though it's kind of exactly what he wanted, and, and to some extent, 
you know, cooperated with it. You know? Well, you know, it's funny, you know, talking about all this, I don't know if it's really funny. <laughs> it's funny in some kind of way. You know, this, this notion uh, you mentioned earlier in the book in, in discussing Terrence McKenna, that his subversion of reality might be understood as a, as a form of activism. You know, that he wasn't trying to upset a political order. He was interested in upsetting an ontological order. And when you think about that in terms of all three of these characters, and perhaps even especially Phil Dick as being prophets of the mature cybernetic era that we're, we're living in, this notion of, I think we've, you know, we've discussed this on my show and yours, I think, that that lack of settledness that he's performing is an honest relationship to the real when, you know, like living in this era, you get conflicting information about everything. It's impossible to source a fact, you know, it's impossible to, to, to locate it and, and pull it up at the root and admire it as a thing unto itself anymore, you know, and, and everything exists in this, you know, these fields of kind of uh, interference patterns between mutually exclusive <laughs> worldviews and you've said it better than i that this is this is a world that we may not be comfortable in but we recognize in the writing of these men and as you say in in the book the most powerful weird tales like you're talking about the mechanical dimension to this you know the desire to 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 talk about it as a physical thing the most powerful weird tales are rooted in the rhetoric of reality so I mean, even though maybe it didn't seem in the 70s as though this had implications uh, in terms of like global geopolitics, now I'm not so sure. You know, now it seems to me like it has obvious implications. I'm, you know, I'm doing my best to perform the responsible amount of Gnostic skepticism or whatever (laughs) about all of this. But it does seem like the more that this becomes the daily lived experience of people, the more that the self-producing texts of the visionaries of that 70s generation spin out and become the hurricane that we're all living in, that it really does beg certain questions about, you know, that, that you and I have discussed about who is actually at the wheel here and whether it makes sense to assign like the way that we think about human leadership, for example, or the governance of communities is going to be radically transformed by this because suddenly we have to let in the non-human into that and we have to open up, we have to stop seeking some sort of political equilibrium, you know, some, we, 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 we stop tilting after utopia. I don't know, like, where do you feel this lands in terms of our actual... Like the Twitterverse, <laughs> for example. Yeah, it's, those are tough questions, man. You know, I'm I'm really deeply ambivalent about this stuff, and I I um, I think one of the places I I tend to stand is is sort of not knowing, and that's not necessarily the most interesting conversation to have because I'm like I don't I don't know, but um, to you know not take the take the easy way out. I do feel like the sort of ontological instability that is the perturbations in the reality field that are introduced by these kinds of texts, these kinds of experiences, you know, are now at our front door uh, as a as a whole society, and that the more challenging effects and the more dangerous possibilities of this kind of approach. I think paranoia is a great example. All three of the guys that I talked to, I talked about, were um, talked to. I don't know that many. I guess I did talk to them in some sense. Um, you know, what, you know, spent some serious time in in paranoia or in in inflation, the the sort of amplification of the self and and a sort of sense of conviction. You know, at at points, uh, which is sort of the flip side of the skepticism. And I think we can see all that today super manifold everywhere and particularly robert anton wilson and his games with conspiracy theory read very differently today they're it's not so funny and it's it seems dangerous so what do you do with that you know in a way it's kind of like the gnostic secret got out it was it was never designed to be mainstream it doesn't necessarily work on the mainstream you need to have us to go back to our 
conversation, it's good to have a strong symbolic order around. It might be cruel in some ways, but at least it provides something to even struggle against, you know, but it has some kind of consistency. So there's this idea that, well, what we got to do is destroy, break down, expand, replace, transcend the symbolic order. And that's that kind of the kind of politics, quote unquote, that's motivating someone like Terrence McKenna, who's like, well, political revolution didn't change the ontological order, of, you know, or the, the order of things. So let's approach it at the level of ontology. Let's say that there's actually some way we can rejigger reality itself at the level of some kind of alchemical psychedelic operation to initiate us into some galactic civilization or whatever the crazy idea was. But in some sense, destroying or freaking or weirding the symbolic order. And now we get to see what it looks like when the symbolic order consensus reality breaks down, melts, multiplies, becomes weaponized, and we try to make our way through that. And it's not so fun. It's not so pretty. It's not so groovy. It's not wacky tunes. I think there are really important connections between our current situation and what you might think of as psychedelic or shamanic reality. A lot of them aren't necessarily super happy tunes. I think that psychedelic users have a leg up in some ways, particularly ones who are capable of of, of taking on the, the darker, more fragmented, more confusing aspects of psychedelics, which is not necessarily what we see emphasized in a lot of um, discourse today, but I think in some ways are actually, uh, uh, you know, the, the greater teaching tools uh, in psychedelics are the more challenging ones, both in terms of dealing with this, th this aspect of contemporary reality and also dealing with our own demise, which to my mind is the ultimate justification for psychedelic use is that there ain't anything else that's getting you that close to what it's like to die and we're all going to do it. So, you know, let's let's do a few test runs or something like a test run. So, I you know I I I think that there is that quality of of a sort of breakdown in the situation, but it does mean that there's room to maneuver. There does mean that there are that the liveliness of stories and the vividness of stories, the attractiveness of stories, the eros of stories does have a, a place to move and potentially move quite rapidly. Why is it so dark? Why is there so much aggression and, and so little peace, love and magic in, in a sense? I'm not sure. You know, I'm not really sure why the possibilities that are that are available now aren't taken up more in, a, in the light side of things. And I hope that it's a phase, maybe a long phase, maybe a deep phase, but that one of the, I think, brilliances of, of psychedelics in general as a kind of culture, and maybe I'm fooling myself to some degree, is that in addition to initiating us into some of these difficulties and to some of the tricksiness of reality and to some of the traumatic quality of the real, even, that they also provide a incredibly rich, evocative, communal cosmic, you know, nature-charged, cosmos-charged, yes, you know, a great affirmation, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, and I feel sometimes that that kind of fundamental affirmation is something that's increasingly hard to get to in our ordinary lives, and particularly if we're thinking about the world, thinking about the future. So, you know, I think that the naive celebration of this kind of subverting of reality has no place anymore. I mean, we've 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 seen what happens with that. Does it mean that we try to go back and say, "Yeah, science, science, science"? Let's go back to the way it used to be. Um, that might be nice. It might be hard to do. But once we give up the idea of truth, whether we think about truth in science or in more than scientific or alongside scientific terms, you know, once you give up truth or something like truth, then it's just power. And then we're in that shamanic world of power. And the world, the shamanic world is the world of power. You know, it's what Don Juan talked about. It's what the anthropologists talk about. It's a world of power. It's a world of struggle, alliances, tricks, energies, healing, 
illness, disease, it's uh, that's it, you know, and, and maybe that is our, our ultimate kind of reality. But whatever in human in humanity is also a truth seeker, and has the has that value, you know, it still seems a good flag to rally around. Mm, I don't know, we'll just leave it there. Eric, it's been so awesome to uh, get this extra long talk with you. Your book was extraordinary. It's a real it's a real work, and I, I feel very lucky to have been among the first few thousand people to read it. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, I really appreciate all your, your work and your, your questions. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Future Fossils. This podcast is a part of the MindPod Network, along with numerous other excellent programs. Go to mindpodnetwork.com and subscribe to them all. If you'd like to help support Future Fossils, consider giving this show a five-star iTunes review or sharing it with someone you think might appreciate these conversations. For more episodes, show notes, copious extras, including music, art, the Future Fossils coloring book and book club, and more, visit patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. 